tenants. Number one is income. To when I look at somebody's okay. income, I want There's to houses see in that area that they have to times. take the lower end of $2,300. Now, the Hello! Today we'll be talking about landlords and everything problematic with the idea of landlordism. To get the primary thesis of the video out of the way, landlords are mostly parasitical in the economic sense, people who hoard property in order to profit from the misery of inbuilt income inequality that exists and that they massively contribute to within capitalist societies. I'm not talking about individual landlords here or their moral character, just the entire institution. Furthermore, I care less about your elderly grandparents that work their whole lives to have a single property to rent for their retirement, and more about the multi-million and billion dollar individuals and companies that own dozens if not hundreds and thousands of properties with basically no oversight. Historically landlords over land got it through aristocratic privilege, politically preferential treatment for the ruling class, or outright robbery. This is the story of pretty much all large non-state owned land, be it first world or third. Let's share a few quotes from Adam Smith and Karl Marx on the subject of renting and landlordism in general, shall we? Landlord's right has its origin in robbery. The landlord, like all other men, loves to reap what they never sowed, and demand a rent even for the natural produce of the earth. The landlord is the one whose revenue costs them neither labor nor care, but comes to them, as it were, of its own accord, and independent of any plan or project of their own. Adam Smith even dunks on the idea that landlords justify themselves by maintaining the land that they own. The rent of land, it may be thought, is frequently no more than a reasonable profit or interest for the stock laid out by the landlord upon its improvement. This no doubt may be partly the case upon some occasions. The landlord demands, one, a rent even for unimproved land, and the supposed interest or profit upon the expense of improvement is generally in addition to this original rent. Two, those improvements, besides, are not always made by the stock of the landlord, but sometimes by that of the tenant. When the lease comes to be renewed, however, the landlord commonly demands the same augmentation of rent as if they had been all made by his own. 3. He sometimes demands rent for what is altogether incapable of human improvement. Now if you'll indulge me one more quote, Marx beautifully says, Let us now see how the landlord exploits everything from which society benefits. Every improvement in the circumstances of society tends either directly or indirectly to raise the real rent of land, to increase the real wealth of the landlord, his power of purchasing the labor, or the produce of the labor of other people. In essence, according to Smith and Marx, landlords are those who love to benefit from labor they didn't do, who contribute next to nothing as a generator of revenue from their so-called investment, and are ones that benefit from society without benefiting society themselves. Now, are there any good landlords? Well, no, not really. Again, this isn't a moral argument or a commentary on the character of individual landlords, but even in the best case scenario, where you have a landlord that charges you a so-called reasonable amount, actually repairs stuff and is nice to you, there still is an imbalance in this relationship, one predicated on violence through threat of eviction, mind you. Firstly, how nice he is to you depends on your paying of the rent, and out of the money you pay, he takes a sum and uses it to repair stuff, so in all honesty it's you paying for the repairs of someone else's property, and the so-called reasonable amount he charges doesn't change whether the mortgage on the property is paid off or not. In fact, I've never heard of a rent discount once a mortgage on a property was paid off, which should be logical for the oh-so-nice landlord. He is still sitting on and profiting from property that you could have gotten a mortgage yourself to pay and actually live in the damn place instead of just accumulating property to rent out, but the bank deemed you too insecure of an investment to make monthly $600 payments. As a result, you pay $1,200 to a landlord, month in and month out, for your entire life, basically. Someone, or more commonly a massive corporate entity, just so happens to start off with more money than you, and as a result, you have to continuously put money into the cycle of ever-increasing income inequality despite having the long-term ability to pay off shelter that you would actually be living in. This point cannot be understated. Unless you already have money, the system is rigged against you. Sadly, or better yet predictably, capitalism turns most necessities, shelter being primary among them, into speculative assets. The housing stock is already built, the workers paid, actual homes just sitting there, but instead comes a landlord buy, buys up several of those already existing properties and extracts profits from the most vulnerable in society. Of course, this isn't even talking about slumlords, through which quite a many seemingly respectable businessmen got their starts. Statistics and Realities This is all according to a great article titled There is no such thing as a good landlord, linked in the pinned comment below. In the UK alone, there is a housing need of 4.7 million people. The figure in the US is over 5 million. 
with a need to build 340,000 new homes every year until 2031 to make up the amount. The actual number being built was only 160,000. At the same time, there are 320,000 people homeless in the UK, with almost half of those being children, and 1.15 million people on waiting lists for social housing. In the US, the official figure for homelessness is nearly 600,000 people, but the actual amount is much, much higher due to clever sleight of hand intended to paint a more pleasant picture. What this all means is that the supply doesn't meet the demand, mouthwatering use for a prospective landlord. Less supply with a constant if not rapidly increasing demand means property value skyrocket. A two-way street, of course, as more landlords try to buy up as much as they can chasing this golden goose, further increasing property prices. People already renting see the potential of ever owning their own property drifting farther and farther away as housing stock depletes and becomes increasingly more expensive, with the average house price being 8 times the UK average wage, and as high as 14 times that in London. The figure is only slightly better at 7 times the average US yearly salary in the United States. In the UK, if you don't earn the equivalent of $83,000 a year, or nearly $140,000 a year in London, then it will be virtually impossible for you to ever own your own place. In the US, to afford the average house price of $374,000 via mortgage, you would need a minimum income of $105,000 per year. For many, a virtual impossibility. You either rent or you're on the streets. Thus, you have no choice but to rent and pay whatever price desired by the landlord as shelters kinda non-negotiable. This isn't even speaking of the lack of options those homeless have, of which thousands die every year during the winter. After all, those homeless and the high likelihood of disease or death are the threat landlords use to force renters to accept ridiculous asking amounts for, in many cases, old, unrenovated, poorly heated, and spatially restrictive homes. The system is fundamentally weighed in favor of landlords, with the average one making more than twice the average national salary within the UK. The US has muddier stats, but the number falls between one and a half to three times the average national salary depending on how you measure it. Even if there's a downturn in the market and rent goes lower, they still have a property, an asset, something with the potential to appreciate the second the market bounces back. This is the story pretty much everywhere. Most people spend about 25% of their monthly income on rent, and in some places this number can be as high as 30, 40, 60% or even higher of your monthly income. And the beauty is you can't do anything about it because usually all the good jobs are in large cities with already bloated renting or property markets. Fundamentally, landlords both create and profit from the existence of poverty and homelessness. In all lessons, rent is a tax placed by the better off in society on usually the poorest in society for daring to be poor and want to live somewhere habitable. Back to the video in just a second. Let's hear from today's sponsor, Atlas VPN. For a lot of research that I do for my videos, I end up hitting pages that aren't available in my location. That's frustrating as you can imagine, geo restriction really does suck. But not with Atlas VPN. For those unaware, a virtual private network makes all of your internet traffic travel through an encrypted tunnel. This way protects you from spying, public Wi-Fi dangers, and hides your IP address and your online activities. It even allows you to change your location for all your researching needs. Currently, Atlas VPN has more than 6 million users worldwide, and boasts the best VPN deal on the market, with the most affordable online protection plan for just under $2 per month with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So what are you waiting for? Go down to the description and click that link, use my code Hakeem and get a 3 year subscription for just $1.83 a month with 3 months free. But that's not all. You get blazing fast speeds for streaming or gaming, unlimited protection for all your devices, an inbuilt ad and malware blocker, and you'll get to save some extra cash as Atlas VPN will find you the best deals online for everything from your online subscriptions to airlines, hotels, and more. Grab this big deal because now Atlas VPN Premium is just $183 per month plus 3 months extra and with a 30 day money back guarantee. Protect your privacy and get the many benefits of Atlas VPN for this ridiculously low price. You can grab this deal by clicking the link in the video description below. Be quick as it's a time limited offer. Massive thanks to Atlas VPN for the sponsorship, this is what allows me to pay my editor fairly so the support is highly appreciated. All right, back to the video. Landlords are superfluous. It's absentee ownership. Landlords earn money from tenants due to property rights, not their labor. Landlords make their money while sleeping, eating, or just existing while you go to work every single day. All while not living there and being able to charge you however much they want and dictate terms on how you live in your own home, which isn't really your own home. As with every argument in the support of capitalism, choice is equated with an ultimatum. They take the money you pay them to pay off the property and then take a little extra as profit. Everything a landlord does or pays for comes from your wallet, be it property tax, maintenance, or whatever else. If the landlord didn't exist, then the tenant would pay less overall. Landlords are unnecessary middlemen that profit off of poverty and homelessness. There is no skill required to buy housing, with the only requirement being money or access to finance. To notice that there is a need in a community for housing is to notice that people need food, meaning a completely ridiculous thing to stake your right to hoard housing to. 
To quote the Greater Manchester Housing Action, a landlord might argue that they possess a skill in predicting in advance when a residential area will gentrify, and then use their skill to invest shrewdly in such areas to bring themselves greater profit margins. Such a skill is of no benefit to society, so it's unclear why it warrants financial reward. Minimal bravery is required to invest in a rental property. In the unlikely event a landlord fails to find some desperate soul to rent their purchase to, they still have a capital asset that is likely to have appreciated in value. The administrative burden of being a landlord is minimal when compared with running a cotton mill or a curry house. Relevant examples from earlier in the article. Arranging viewings, having to occasionally call a plumber, supplying annual gas safety certificates, etc. are not arduous tasks. Despite this, many landlords either fail to fulfill their small role adequately, or subcontract to a letting agent, who is usually effectively paid by the renter through further inflated rent. By the time a landlord takes ownership of a home, the home already exists. The workers involved in the hard work of physical construction give society its housing stock and the renter their shelter, not the landlord. Our housing stock has already been paid for. That we continue to pay for it again and again in perpetuity is a form of collective madness. The problem is systemic. It's not the individual landlords that are the problem, it's the existence of the landlord layer of society that is. The existence of this entire group that own housing for whatever reason and leaves the rest unable to do the same unless they pay a monthly fee to use said housing that the landlord just has and doesn't use is a societal issue, regardless of whether the person you're renting from is a good or bad person. A potential solution and conclusion. <laughs> I did not intend for that to rhyme. The obvious solution is socialism, with publicly owned housing for all. Pretty much every single socialist country, both historically as well as today, had either eliminated homelessness or have negligent amounts, especially compared to the behemoth homeless populations of the US, UK, and rest of the so-called prosperous Western capitalist democracies. I have spoken extensively on socialism elsewhere, and concrete steps can only be taken through direct action, organization building, and agitation. To quote an interesting idea termed the people's rented sector from the same Manchester source earlier, if we broke away from landlordism, our housing costs would be limited to the cost of keeping our homes in a good state of repair and fit for human habitation, alongside a small contribution to the cost of continually replenishing the nation's housing stock. For most renters, this would represent a life-changing reduction in housing costs. We would then all have the choice to either use the money saved on things that actually bring us happiness, or cut our working hours giving us more leisure time to do things that bring us happiness. And we would do so living without fear of homelessness. The overall benefit to society would be immense. Interesting, in my opinion, as one prong of a multifaceted political approach towards housing when working within the capitalist system. However, the only concrete and permanent change will come with the overthrow of the capitalist system and the construction of socialism. Here's the crappy arguments landlords and their bootlickers use to justify their existence. Hilariously, when doing a bit of research to find the absolutely strongest arguments landlords have, you come across insane takes like, I have to provide access for the disabled, and if I, from my eternal benevolence, didn't provide housing, the homeless would proliferate, proliferate I say, despite conveniently forgetting that eviction is one of the largest reasons for homelessness, and the fact that to these people the possibility is either be homeless or be a tenant absolutely no room to entertain the possibility of people owning the homes they live in, if only we lived in a sane world where regular people aren't priced out by investment firms, or better yet, housing is socialized. Furthermore, you come across stuff like this in which, when enumerating all the things landlords do, over half the points are have money, and the other half being spend the tenant's money. By the way, the guy that posted this is some business bro type trying to shill his books on flipping houses, and has some other gems such as this to say. There is no law stopping them, meaning the poors, from buying houses and renting them out for whatever price they think is fair, or even for free. Yes, this is the caliber of people we're dealing with. Anyways, let's jump right into it. But landlords are doing a social good by providing housing. The most common argument you'll come across, in my opinion. Their logic goes that without their generosity in allowing you to rent, homelessness would proliferate as landlords, apparently, buy property in order to provide the poor somewhere to stay for an affordable rate. Where would we be without such philanthropes? And I thought they were in it for the money. Silly me. Joking aside, this delusion is part of that trash can of ideology we always hear about. In reality, landlords in, for example, the UK have prevented 2.2 million families from home ownership in 2018 alone. I've seen a silly comparison that they do a lot that goes like this. Why would providing housing and charging for it be any more evil than a farmer growing food and selling it, a baker charging for the bread he baked, or any other commerce for profit? Well, in those examples, the baker or farmer are actually, you know, working. They're providing a tangible good. They're not renting the bread or vegetables to you while they own them. Once you pay, you own them and can do whatever you like with them. Landlords own housing and expect to profit indefinitely from something they most likely inherited the money for, if not the property itself. 
Furthermore, landlords don't provide housing, they own housing. Big difference. Not only this, but rather than providing housing, they play an active role in preventing people from becoming homeowners themselves. For example, in the UK, roughly half of all people born between 1981 and 2000 will be renting well into middle age, and a third as retirees. Furthermore, the number of private tenants between the ages of 35 and 54 have already nearly doubled over the last decade. The figures aren't better for the US, by the way, where 12% plan on renting forever, and a further 37% want to avoid, quote, the pains of home ownership, such as furniture, monthly fees, such as property tax and homeowners insurance, and repairs that can tack on unexpected expenses. Basically meaning they wouldn't be able to afford the stuff necessary for the house, even if they could afford the house itself in the first place. That's not a preference to rent, but a sad admission as to how horrible the economic situation of most Americans is. This doesn't even touch on the reproduction of poverty and social inequality as a result of landlordism. To quote the Greater Manchester Housing Action, Picture a renter who has lived in their home for 30 years. Over this time, they will pay a rent each month at a rate their landlord calculates is necessary to cover the landlord's mortgage payments, deposit, stamp duty, etc., the cost of keeping the property in a good state of repair and fit for human habitation, the landlord's profit, meaning the amount on top of the cost of supplying the property that makes the arrangement worthwhile to the landlord, after 25 years, the renter has paid off their landlord's mortgage. Of course, their rent is not reduced to reflect this landmark. Several years later, the landlord retires and decides to sell the property to a new landlord. The new landlord takes out a mortgage to purchase their asset, and it is now the role of the renter to toil away to pay this off for them. On and on this merry-go-round will go until housing is taken out of the hands of commercial landlords. To conclude, landlords don't rent houses for charity. They do it because they can charge more than the cost of maintenance, and people who don't own land or housing will pay whatever the asking price is because it's better to get ripped off in a rental than to be homeless and live under a bridge. It's in fact the exact opposite of generosity and philanthropy. But landlords risk, so therefore they deserve profit. Do they really, though? Real estate is arguably one of the most secure investments one can make, and even if no one wants to rent or the value of the property goes down, the landlord still has an asset that he can sell for a massive cash injection directly into his pocket. Not exactly a bad deal. Also, risk is a stupid argument. Human traffickers and drug dealers also risk quite a bit. To argue that they deserve whatever because they've risked is stupidity, and likewise for landlords or anyone else who risks. But those are legal examples there's no way you can compare. Except, yeah, I can. Get that critical thinking going a bit. If state-determined legality was the only thing that makes some risks acceptable or even laudable, while other risks something to condemn, what really is the material difference there? This is not equating landlordism with drug trafficking, mind you. This is just a criticism of the concept of risk. Also, how one risks property they've inherited, or a massive corporation with thousands of properties risks their investment, is beyond me. This also kind of ties into another point in that most people do some kind of labor. They actively work in order to earn their keep. This labor plays a positive role in the development of society, and if said workers disappear, there would be a noticeable change. Not so for landlords, though. All they do is own, and if they cease to exist, well, you'd scarcely notice. But they maintain, slash cut the grass, like blah blah, yeah, we'll, we'll get to that. Arguably, though, the only risk taken is by society in keeping landlords, and of course the tenants that risk being kicked out onto the street. But rental contracts are voluntary. This argument is ridiculous because fundamentally, rental contracts are done under duress. When your options are either being homeless or pay whatever a landlord demands, including sexual favors during the latest COVID happenings, then you can't exactly honestly claim that's a fully voluntary agreement taking place, now can you? This of course doesn't touch on other factors that are completely involuntary yet perpetuate social inequality, especially along racial lines, be it in settler colonial or formerly colonial nations. In the US, double the amount of black households rent, 58%, as compared to white households, 28%. What this means is that rather than saving for their own property, African Americans disproportionately contribute nearly half their income every month to rental payments, further forcing them into a system predicated on keeping them impoverished. The solution here isn't more black landlords, but the socialization of homes so that no one is homeless, no one is forced to rent, and no one owns vast tracts of land and property, further deepening the divide in an already divided nation. But landlords have to do managerial and servicing work on their properties. Let's quote a landlord I found lamenting how much work he has to do. Speaking as a landlord, I say no. I take all the risk. I provide decent living accommodations for a tenant where he knows the rent and all the costs in advance. And if something breaks, I have to fix it at my expense. I have to cut down the grass, maintain the building, obey all the laws regarding lead paint and smoke detectors. I'm not allowed to discriminate against what kind of tenant I can take. I am even forced by law to make reasonable accommodations for the handicapped. I cannot even go into the apartment without the permission of the tenant unless there's an emergency. So, you're not allowed to be racist. You have to make sure a handicapped tenant can actually get into the property. 
You have to make sure that there aren't toxic chemicals in the walls and you can't blatantly violate the privacy of your tenants whenever you want. Oh, poor you. Here, have a tax incentive. Jesus Christ. Firstly, most landlords do not build the houses themselves, developers hire workers to do it. Most landlords don't do the maintenance themselves, they hire people to do it for them, if they even bother, which, if you've ever rented, you'd be acutely aware of the quality of the landlord paint job phenomenon. Most landlords don't do the gardening, they hire gardeners to do it, if at all. And the cherry on top is that they're paying these people with money that comes from your pocket, your rent, and still skimming some from the top as profit. Hell, even if the landlord has a mortgage on the property, it's not them paying the fees for that mortgage, it's all coming out of the rent you pay. A garbage article from Investopedia, Jesus Christ, has some garbage article titled 7 Homeowner Costs Renters Don't Pay, of which all listed things aside from the original purchase of the property are paid from the rent the tenant pays, if the home was even purchased outright in the first place rather than on mortgage that, again, you pay. I have my own bills to pay, how am I supposed to put food on the table without being a landlord? To quote the same source I cited earlier, Given the traditional landlord battle cry of, I've got my own bills to pay too, don't you know? Readers may be surprised to learn that nearly half of landlords own their renters' homes outright, meaning without a mortgage. For these landlords, the ongoing cost of supplying a property to a renter is limited to the costs incurred in keeping the property in a good state of repair and fit for human habitation. In comparison to average rents, these costs are negligible. According to research by the insurer More Than, the national average expenditure necessary on a three-bedroom home for repair work, maintenance, and building insurance is only £73.17 per month. In comparison, the average rent on a three-bedroom home in Manchester in 2018 was £895. Per month, more than 10 times the average ongoing cost to the mortgage-free landlord in supplying the property. To put it another way, such a landlord's yearly costs would be covered by payment on their first month's rent, with change to spare, with every payment thereafter being pure profit. Also, um, get a job? Dip into that rainy day fund. Cut down on the avocado toast, perhaps. No wonder they bitch about risk so much, apparently a single expense can ruin them. They do well to be more fiscally responsible. <laughs> Laws are in favor of tenants, we landlords have no power! This is a point so laughable that I barely need to go over it. In the UK, 1 in 5 ministers of parliament are landlords, as compared to 2% of the general public. In the US, at least 238 federal lawmakers are also landlords. More than 200 senior congressional staffers also own properties and land they rent across the US. Furthermore, there is no limit under current law on how much they can rake in as landlords, a neat little exploit to get out of the income limit they're supposed to have beside their federal salary. An interesting article on the topic is, here's how many landlords are in the Washington legislature, which I suggest you read. In 2016 in the UK, a blatant example of landlord influence saw 72 private landlord MPs contributing to defeating a labor bill which, as a clause, would have required private landlords to make homes fit for human habitation. This was shot down. But yes, dear landlord, you're oppressed because of some loose legal protection preventing you from immediately evicting the single mother working minimum wage with two kids. That's the issue here. But some people prefer renting. Yeah, fuck off, no one prefers renting. The absolute smallest minority of people that have to move around a lot might prefer the convenience of renting, sure, but that doesn't justify private ownership of hundreds of properties for single individuals or the entire system of landlordism. If people need to move around a lot for work and require housing, then rotating housing plans for such industries is something the state can and should do, rather than, well, landlords. Furthermore, for the vast majority of people who live and work in one place and don't need to move around a lot, the clear preference is ownership. Also, those that attempt to paint renting versus owning as some quirky choice people make seem to forget that going from renting to owning isn't easy. In many areas across the US, and the rest of the world for that matter, landlords are buying up every house that hits the market and converting them to rentals or Airbnbs. This is especially so in third world capitals with heavy tourist presence. The people who actually live there can't actually afford to live there. In the US, a common sight is seeing cash offers with nearly $100,000 over asking price for property that just dropped onto the market. Not from that cute couple with 2.3 kids, but from some conglomerate or investment firm buying up to rent. This is not a sane way to organize housing. Through my hard work, I got this property, so I deserve this property as an investment. This is the only argument that can at least be somewhat defended. I don't have an issue with your grandparents that have a single property they rent out to help with their retirement. My issue is with corporate renting, in which dozens, hundreds, and even thousands of housing units are owned by a single individual or a company. The problem is systemic, and that's why the issue isn't for you to aspire to be a landlord as the only solution, but to abolish the concept of landlordism entirely. If you're a working couple who actually contribute to society and have one rental property on the side, hey, capitalism is brutal and you can't be faulted for trying to secure your livelihood. 
The issue is, though, that the system not only necessitates this behavior, but actively encourages hoarding and inhumane business practices. You yourself are not at fault, in my opinion. Those that own 300 apartments, though, those deserve the, the mound treatment. Abolish landlordism, dismantle capitalism, and begin the construction of socialism. I made several videos on this that you can refer to here. And that's all for this time. If you enjoy what I do, then please consider supporting me on Patreon, it really does help. I'd like to thank my patrons, so thank you to Nitro Dubs, Kenny, Thomas Roberts, Nicholas, Owen Baker, T. Wood, Dr. Lemonman, Lumix, Charlie and Eric, Ultimate Turin, Daniel Ethel, The Generic Guy, Santiago Pereira, Rain, Xander Corvus, David Fries, Confuse M, Mariana Mastosevich, Robbie Richardson, and Masei Kudrow. Thanks for watching.